Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and today we have a very exciting guest, a physician author. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Comp Health. If you're a physician looking for a new job or considering locum tenens for the first time, make sure to check out Comp Health. I've worked locums with Comp Health, and I appreciate the personalized experience I have with my recruiter, who is dedicated to my specialty and knows my needs and goals. Comp Health also offers full time permanent jobs if you are looking for a longer term switch. For more information, check out comphealth.com. Now, without further ado, welcome Tammy. Thank you, Andrew. I'm happy to be here. Tammy, I asked you to be on the show and I'm thrilled that you are because you are a very humble, I'm sure, but very dedicated writer. And uh, I have a, a big place in my heart for writers. It's something I've been trying to do for years and years. And I see that, is it your first novel that was just published? That was my debut back in uh, March of 2021. Right, but but let's be clear, it's not your first writing. You've published nope. many other pieces, isn't that correct? Lots of medical articles in anesthesiology and medical education, and then I co-wrote a introductory textbook for anesthesia many years ago, and we are in the we're working on the third edition for that. And any short stories, poems, things like that? Quite a lot of short stories. They're um, pretty much all of them are on my website. I have one about to be published in an anthology for a uh, for a dog rescue place about about dogs. Figure. It. Well, since you mentioned it, where can people find you? What's your website? My website is my first initial and last name, www.tuliano.com. And there's short stories there, information about the book and the sequel that comes out in January and um, a place to get on the newsletter and ask me questions if you have any about writing or medicine or whatever. Perfect. I'll put that address in the show notes and also here on the uh, screen for those who are watching on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. You said there's a sequel, so there's already a, a sequel. Was, was it is. conceived that way or you got to the end and you said, oh, there's more. I have to keep going. How, how did that happen? Well, I wrote the first one and um, I, I tied it all up as if it was a, a single book, but um, I really fell in love with my characters and I, I kind of liked their universe and when I found a publisher, they asked me to, to make it a series. And you know, there's only so many bad things an anesthesiologist at an academic institution can be faced with, sort of like the uh, murder she wrote Cabot Cove phenomenon. So, so anytime you have an amateur sleuth, it's a little challenging to make a series, but I'm taking her other places in book three. She's going on a mission trip like I did to Haiti. So it's, um, it's fun to try and come up with different plots that involve the same characters and have them grow and change. Uh, yes, I've done uh, many medical missions to the Philippines and uh, there's wow. probably some fodder there for, uh, <laughs> for some uh, novel. There are bad guys and good guys and desperate situations. Right. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. Why sit in a dark room and write a novel? Well, I sat in a less than dark room for many years. Um, my career sort of had phases. I was super into medical education for the first 10 years of my career. And then I got a, a pretty good research program going and, and got some patents and spun off a couple companies with my husband to make medical devices. And then I became the residency program director and did that, you know, sort of the natural progression of academia. And and then my kids were in high school and I was on a, a trip with my husband and I, it just occurred to me how miserable I was at work. I love taking care of patients. I enjoyed teaching. I hated administration. It was not uh, playing to my strengths. And so I sort of thought, you know, I need to reinvent myself. And, and rather than find a different area of medicine, I decided to sort of branch out and went into to fiction writing 
knowing absolutely nothing about it, which was sort of fun to start at the bottom again and, and uh, sort of humble yourself to learning from people half your age, but, but it was okay. And I learned a lot and, you know, sort of refreshing to my brain to, to learn a whole new field. Right. Something fresh, something, uh, and obviously you uh, appreciate a challenge. Yes. Uh, so how far back was that day until the day the novel, the, from the day from, what was the timing from the, the day you decided to write the novel to the day the novel was published? It was about seven years. Right. So seven That's year right. gestation and a little training period along the way, right? Very much so. Multiple versions of the same story. Um, I realized I got some really great advice that taking all that time to write it and then edit it and then get it rejected and then rewrite it and then get it rejected some more that I needed to use my creative side again. So um, someone suggested I write short stories, which I, I don't really read them, but um, so I went back to the drawing board literally and learned how to write short stories. And, and I learned a ton about the craft of writing. And also you get a couple little victories in there. You know, you get a short story published, you get a few rejected, but then you get another one published as opposed to a novel that takes so long to write and so long to edit. Um, so that really propelled me forward after I started doing that. So you did both simultaneously. I did. Yeah. Like you're a marathon runner, but, but you're also running sprints, right? Just to. Yes. Get... Sort of, you know, I would take a break from the novel and write a couple short stories. I like that. I like that. So let's see. And it, and novel two is already done. It's done and we're working on the cover right now. The publisher gave me one that I wasn't crazy about. So now I'm pretending like I know how to use uh, Paint Shop Pro and <laughs> making some edits to the, to the cover. Yeah, the whole business is just so foreign to me. It's, uh, I'm glad I have a publisher that's wonderful and takes care of everything. Tell us, but who is that? Who is that? It's Ocean View. It's actually um, a physician. She's, uh, Pat Gusson is a family practitioner, retired. And her husband was a, uh, a person at Johnson & Johnson, a big league there. And they formed a publishing company and, and they publish a lot of medical fiction. Um, and they're just wonderful people to work with. A little smaller press, so it's um, not one of the big five sort of um, massive engines, um, but they're, they're great. I didn't feel like I wanted to learn everything I would have to learn to self-publish, so I was grateful to, to use a, a real publisher that uh, could handle all those things that they're really good at and I'm not. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's really uh, exciting. And so they said, gee, we like this. How about do more, do more, yes, right? That's basically what happened. Yeah, they, when we signed the contract, they said, this is for two books. And then as soon as I turned in the second one, they said, we'd like the third one by the summer. We said, oh, I'll have to get busy because sure. I'm not fast yet. <laughs> well, yeah, I think fast is overrated, right? Fast and art don't always, I think Picasso is really fast, but you know, a lot of things just take time to do properly. I would agree. Um, there are people who turn them out way faster and, and probably with far less rewrites than I do. But, um, but you know, medicine, we're, we're perfectionists and it's, uh, it's impossible to be perfect in fiction because there is no perfect, but I, I could edit a sentence forever and I, I have to fix myself of that. Yeah, well, when is it done? I think that's always hard, right? right. Did you get some helpers, you know, people who uh, don't like you and ask them to read it so you could get some real criticism? I, I do. I have um, two critique groups that I'm in. So I submit to them 2,500 words at a time and we cut them to shreds with each other in a positive way. Um, and then I, once the book's done, I use some beta readers that are, are not writers, they're just readers. And they are really terrific about saying, you know, I got lost here, this didn't make sense. This medical terminology is too much, or I'd like to understand more. So it's really helpful to have both writers and readers, at least for me, to, to read what I write. And then of course, Ocean View has an editor that goes through it after I'm satisfied and finds other problems. 
Did Ocean View find these beta readers for you or was that your own mission? No, I actually, um, you know, I've had people who've read other stuff and say, oh, I'd love to beta read for you. And, and they're great and they're very kind, but they're too kind. Um, these are people I've found on Goodreads, which is a, a website. Um, they actually have a whole section on beta readers where you just submit what you wrote and what uh, what you're looking for in a beta read. And then you get, I got, I think, 25 responses within 48 hours of people offering to beta read it. For free. Um, I did it on the charged site. So it was between 50 and and $100 for them to read an 80,000 word book. And I got them back within two or three weeks with very detailed comments. Um, there is a free section. I haven't tried that, but- um, so You thought it was I'm a good confused. investment, a really good I mean, investment. Yeah, I mean, compared to an editor, which can be thousands of dollars, I used a developmental editor for another novel I wrote and I got great useful feedback, but and I can afford it, but it took nine months and, <laughs> and it was, you know, several thousand dollars. So the beta readers get back to me quicker and um, they're not going to tell me how to fix a sentence. They're just going to say, hey, uh, I don't like this character. If that's OK, good. But if you think I want to like them, then you better make them nicer. You know, that's sort of just very much reader based feedback. Yeah, that's very interesting. So if we. If we look at the sales of the novel and the amount of, let's just talk about cash that you put into it, do you come out ahead with sales? Pretty much nobody comes out ahead. I mean, that's, um, I think they said that the median income for a writer is somewhere around $10,000 or something like that. And that per, means that all year? the rest of us, for, Per, pardon? Per book, per year, or? Oh, per year. Per year. Yeah, it's it's um, very hard to make money as a writer until you have a backlist. So you need to have lots of books out there so somebody can read one and then choose to read the next four. Ah, okay. um, traditionally published, you know, I make, I think the average is somewhere around 8% of uh, hard covers and uh, maybe a little more of eBooks. And then, if you spend any money on advertising, it's it's basically sunk costs. Right, um, so it'll be a wash, right? Yeah, so so it's not something you go into expecting to pay the bills um, unless you either write really fast so you can get a backlist really quick, or maybe you have a very, you know, you're a better writer than, than most of us. Um, I write because I love it, because it's a passion of mine. I want people to read it because I have things I think are worth saying about end of life issues and fertility issues and, and sort of the, the ethically murky areas of medicine I enjoy writing about. But, um, but I don't expect to, to live off of my income from it. Now you don't have a pen name, so is there any blowback, you know, from your university? <laughs> Are you concerned that some of the issues uh, you write? I know there was a physician you probably read, Jeffrey Lieberman, who happened to make some offhand comment on uh, Twitter, and now he lo he's out of a job. Right. Um, you, it's. Um, I've wondered about that, and I went to our. I had a big conflict of interest thing anyway because of our patents that I had issues with research I was doing that I had a conflict of interest. So, so I was already very much connected with the attorneys at our hospital. And so I talked to them when I started writing and said, you know, is this something that you guys want to read and vet? And then they said, no. Um, I went to a legal just webcast and asked the question and they said, you know, as long as you don't malign your hospital, they can't um, sue you over it. So it's not named my hospital and it's uh, not in my town. Um, although it's pretty easy to figure out exactly where it is because it's not like I'm in Boston where there's 400 hospitals. Um, but I don't, yeah, you know, I'm careful not to use obvious characters. People I know can figure out who I'm talking about but it's always in a positive light and funny things that happened at the hospital that I put in there that they remember, but anybody else wouldn't be able to figure out who it is. But, but I am cognizant of that. And, and there is uh, a fair amount written on the internet about how to avoid getting in trouble, but you're right. They could get in, get upset with me just for voicing an opinion that they don't like theoretically, but 
I am a tenured professor, so they have a little bit of trouble kicking me out based on that sort of stuff. Excellent planning, I'll say, to become a tenured <laughs> professor first. Good job. <laughs> so, you know, this all begs the question of a very hot topic of work-life balance. I mean, writing a novel, as you point out, is, requires a lot of diligence and time, and you are uh, in practice and you have a family. So, you know, we got a couple minutes here. Tell us your secret. <laughs> I wish I had a time expander. Um, I think that, well, first of all, I would highly recommend a book called 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. It came out a few months ago. Um, it's about the finitude of life. And, and it took me a really long time to, to figure that out. And I'm grateful for the book, but I wish I'd read it 20 years ago. But the whole idea that everything you say yes to is saying no to something else. So pick the things you say yes to. So I got rid of the administrative positions that, well, I got some enjoyment out of helping residents or whatever. It was a big time suck and a big emotional um, bank suck, right? So I would come home exhausted, irritated by the 10% of people who took 90% of my energy to try and keep them in line. Um, and so, you know, I resigned all those positions and, and put my yeses toward the things that, that bring me joy. And, and granted, I waited until my kids were old enough that I wasn't taking time away from them to write. Um, but I went down to 60%. So I have two eight hour days that are free for me to do what I want to do. And then I made a commitment that I was going to be a writer. So I don't spend those eight hour days um, lounging or taking tennis lessons. I use them to write. And then I, I still do the other things, but they are on not writing time. Um, so it really does take a You have to make a commitment that it's something you want to do. And, and the whole idea of every 10 years sort of assessing, where am I, where do I want to go? Because it's so easy to just keep doing what you do because it's what you do without ever really doing a little check to see if it's, it's what you should be doing or what you're meant to be doing if you believe in that. Um, and so I got that advice, every 10 years, reinvent yourself. And, and that's kind of what I've done. And, and I couldn't be happier with where I am now. Well, that's great. And I think that's a, a great place to... Uh wrap up. So tell us the name of the novel and where we can find it. It's called Fatal Intent and it's at Amazon, any booksellers. Um, it's available in uh, hardcover and paperback actually by the time this goes out and um, audiobook. And then the sequel is called Misfire and it comes out next January. Well, Dr. Giuliano, you I want to thank you for uh, joining us here in the Art of Medicine, but you've created a lot of work for me because I always read the books of my guests. And, and, now, and now I'm committed to reading two books <laughs> and it looks like a third book. And uh, so uh, that's just great. That's uh, I hope really you enjoy fantastic. Them. Thank you for having me. Before we close, I'd like to give another thanks to our sponsor, CompHealth. At CompHealth, you can talk with a recruiter who knows your specialty and will actually get to know you and your goals. Consider starting your personalized job search at CompHealth.com. That's CompHealth.com. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe.
www.andrewwilner.com.